the lecture on uh, instruction scheduling. So, in this lecture we will be looking at uh, machine independent now machine dependent optimization and uh, instruction scheduling is one of them. We have seen uh, one type of machine dependent optimization before that is the peephole optimization that was a very simple optimization looking at uh, a window of instructions to find patterns and then you know uh, replace uh, that pattern with a more efficient uh, sequence of instructions and so on. Instruction scheduling is uh, different. So, there are uh, many types of uh, instruction scheduling mechanisms. We are going to see a few of them. Basically, all instruction scheduling mechanisms uh, consider uh, a sequence of instructions in one or more basic blocks. The minimum of course, is uh, one basic block. Then, based on different criteria, they try to reorder the instructions. Why should these instructions be reordered? Well, basically, we want to make sure that uh, the pipelines in the processor, they uh, remain full most of the time and uh, any hiccups in this pipeline are avoided. So, we see how best it can be done by using instruction reordering. So, simple basic block scheduling, then automaton based scheduling, integer programming based scheduling, optimal delayed load scheduling for trees and then uh, trace super block and hyper block scheduling is or some of the instruction scheduling mechanisms algorithms that we are going to consider. So, what exactly is uh, instruction scheduling? As I mentioned, it is nothing but reordering of instructions. So, as to keep the pipelines of the functional units of a processor with full with no stalls. So, no hiccups and uh, instruction scheduling in general is an NP complete problem and it therefore, there is uh, a need for heuristics to take care of instruction scheduling. It is if it is applied on basic blocks, then it is called local instruction scheduling and if it is applied on a sequence of basic blocks, then it is called global instruction scheduling. So, global scheduling requires uh, elongation of basic blocks. So, and these are called uh, super blocks, hyper blocks, etcetera, etcetera. So, let us look at uh, some motivation, why exactly instruction scheduling is needed, what are its advantages and so on. Consider uh, you know this sequence of uh, instructions here. So, we have uh, 7 instructions and uh, we are considering a load store architecture. In other words, uh, any operand must be in a register. So, we have to load the operand into a register and then use it that is the model that we are considering here. So, time to load is uh, 2 cycles and each operation requires 1 cycle. The in this code, this is the dependency graph, directed acyclic graph for this particular uh, code. If you observe this code with the latency that is given here, 2 cycles for load and 1 cycle for op, we immediately see that there are uh, 2 stalls, one at I 3 and another at I 5. Let us see why. So, I 3 loads uh, you know R 1 plus R 2, computes R 1 plus R 2 and puts it into R 3 and R 1 and R 2 are uh, loaded into you know loaded from A and B in the instructions I 1 and I 2. The instruction I 1 would have completed by the time we reach I 3 because 2 cycles would have been completed, but the instruction I 2 which loads B into R 2 would not have completed when we come at come to I 3. So, there is a need to skip one cycle here and that is the stall that we are talking about. And uh, once the result of uh, load instruction in I 2 is ready, the computation of R 1 plus R 2 can take place. Similarly, the instruction I 5, it has R 5 equal to R 3 minus uh, R 4, R 4 is being loaded 
from a memory location C in the instruction I 4, it is not yet complete and therefore, there is a stall at this point. We have to skip an instruction and then you know execute the instruction I 5. So, that means, uh, instead of se uh, these 7 instructions will really require uh, 9 cycles in order to complete. So, now suppose we want to get rid of uh, these stalls, is it possible to reorder these instructions such that the dependences as given in the direct Ada cycle graph are still satisfied. In other words, we definitely want to wait for the loads you know to be completed before we come to I 3 that is the operands must be ready before we come to I 3. Similarly, we want to make sure that R 4 is ready before we come to I 5. Only thing is some reordering of instructions may be possible. So, let us see how. So, here is a new sequence of instructions. There are no stalls here, but dependences are indeed satisfied. How are the stalls eliminated? I 1 remains as it is, I 2 remains as it is, but I 4 is actually replacing the instruction I 3 and I 3 has been pushed down by one cycle. So, in the one uh, step. So, now when we arrive at uh, the instruction I 3 which is R 1 plus R 2, both R 1 and R 2 are ready. The reason is R 1 takes 2 cycles, so it will be ready by the time I 4 is executed. R 2 takes 2 cycles, so that will also be ready by the time I 3 is executed. So, R 1 and R 2 will now contain operands, there is no stall. R 4 of course, would not have completed by the time we execute I 3, but it is not required in the instruction I 3. So, once we finish I 3, we execute I 5 which requires R 4 and uh, R 4 would have got its operand by the time we reach I 5 because 2 cycles have lapsed. So, this particular sequence of instructions actually completes just in just 7 cycles, it does not take 9 cycles at all. That is because we have just swapped this instructions uh, I 4 and I 3, all others have remained the same. So, I 4 is in the slot with the load instruction and I 3 is in this slot with the computation instruction. So, this is a very simple example which shows that a subtle change in the order of uh, execution of the instructions will lead to removal of the stalls. That does not mean every stall can be removed. There will be some stalls which cannot be removed as we will see in uh, later examples and uh, we will have to insert uh, no ops in those stalls in those uh, uh, you know cycles. So, quickly to recapitulate what we need here, we definitely want to look at uh, the same dependences flow, anti and output as we studied in parallelization, but these are now at the register and load levels. Okay. They are not at the higher levels, but uh, between statements etcetera, they are at the machine instruction level. For example, uh, I 1 is R 1 is loaded with R load of you know R 2. So, and then I 2 is R 3 equal to R 1 plus 4 and I 3 I 2 is R 3 equal to R 1 plus 4 and I 3 is R 1 equal to R 4 plus R 5. So, here the value which is uh, actually loaded into R 1 is used in uh, I 2. So, I 1 delta I 2 holds. Similarly, whatever is uh, loaded into R 3 okay, uh, is uh, actually it is uh, uh, sorry whatever is uh, read from R 1 is uh, later uh, you know replaced in the instruction I 3. So, there is an anti dependence between uh, I 2 and I 3. So, that is I 2 delta bar I 3 and then we also have uh, I 1 delta naught I 3 because we are actually loading into the same register R 1, I 1 and I 3 are related by output dependence. So, anti and output dependences can be eliminated by register renaming, we have seen some examples of this in parallelization. So, for example, here we do not use R 1, we just use uh, say maybe R 6 or something like that then automatically there is no output dependence between these two. Sim so, and that automatically eliminates uh, this anti dependence as well. 
So, what is a dependence uh, direct acyclic graph? Well, it is the same dependence graph as we studied in parallelization. It is just that uh, here we have uh, at the machine instruction level. So, here is a simple example. This is uh, the sequence of instructions, which is a running example that we are going to use. So, I 1 to I 9, 9 instructions. There are 9 instructions here, 9 nodes here. These are the uh, nodes of the directed acyclic graph. Each instruction is a node. There is a, a solid arc from one node to another node and uh, that shows a flow dependence. For example, you know between uh, I 1 and I 3, okay, so T 1 is equal to load A, T 3 equal to T 1 plus 4. So, there is a load, uh, there is a uh, flow dependence. Similarly, another flow dependence between I 1 and uh, I 4 and so on and so forth. So, all the flow dependences are shown in solid lines. Then the anti dependences are uh, shown using the dashed line. So, this is the dashed line from I 1 to I 9. So, here is I 1 and here is I 9. So, you may wonder why load A in I 1 and B equal to store T 5 in I 9 have been linked by an anti dependence. The reason is uh, memory disambiguation which says that this A and this B are different has not been done. So, no algorithm has been applied to find out whether A and B are the same location or are different locations. So, because of that conservatively we will have to assume that there is an anti dependence from I 1 to I 9 because A and B could be the same. Similarly, B uh, this B of course, is the same. So, I 2 and I 9 also have uh, a dependence. So, this is I 2 and this is I 9. Okay. So, here I 2 and I 9. Similarly, uh, you know I 1 and I 8, I, I, one, I, I 2 and I 8 also have uh, similar anti dependence. So, here and here. Okay. So, these are the anti dependences that need to be depicted in this dependence diagram. Then there may be output dependences. So, those are shown by dash dot line. So, here is uh, an output dependence and output dependence is uh, between these two. Again memory disambiguation has not been done. So, we do not know that B and C are different uh, memory locations. So, there is an anti dependence from I 8 to I 9 sorry there is an output dependence from I 8 to I 9. So, the dependence diagram shows all this. Now, the problem of instruction scheduling would be to rearrange instructions in this sequence. So, as to respect all these flow anti and output dependences yet to minimize the number of stalls that may occur in the sequence. So, the first algorithm that we are going to study is the basic block scheduling. So, what is our model? We need to study the model uh, of a basic block. So, a basic block is assumed to consist of uh, what are known as micro operation sequences MOS which are indivisible. In other words, if a if an instruction contains 3 or 4 uh, micro operations in it, we need to once we start that instruction all the micro operations in it will have to be completed and there is no way we can uh, divide this sequence of 4 micro operations into 2 each and uh, schedule them separately. So, once the instruction is started all the micro operations will run one after another they are indivisible. Each MOS has several steps and each one of these steps will require resources. Each step of an MOS requires one cycle for execution. So, this is the assumption. There are precedence constraints and there are also resource constraints. These must be satisfied by the reordered or scheduled program. So, we have uh, the diagram I showed here. This shows the precedence constraints. See, So, once we say uh, there is a delay between these two, uh, or the delay on this edge could be the time of execution of the load instruction. Automatically, this becomes a weighted directed acyclic graph. 
and that shows all the precedences uh, that must be satisfied. The precedences relate to data dependencies and execution delays as I mentioned just now, but the dependence diagram does not show the resource constraints. So, resource constraints relate to limited availability of shared resources. So, in other words uh, suppose I want to execute this add, this sub and this add and there is only one adder. It is even though we may find that these three can be executed at the same step, it is not possible for us to schedule them in the same step because there is only one adder. Compulsorily we may have to schedule them in three successive cycles. So, that is what uh, resource constraint is all about. Here is the basic block scheduling problem. So, first of all the basic block is uh, modeled as a digraph G with a set of nodes V and a set of edges E and uh, R is the number of resources that we are going to have in the system in the processor. The nodes of uh, the graph G or micro operation sequences and edges of the graph E show the precedences. There is also a label on the node V instead of uh, uh, you know the edge alone we also have a label on the node. So, the label on the node indicates uh, a resource usage function. So, what is this? There is a resource usage function rho v i for each step of the MOS associated with i uh, with the node v. So, in other words if there are 4 steps in an MOS associated with node v, each of these 4 steps will require resources. So, rho v of 1 uh, says how many resources of a particular type are needed for this particular micro operation sequence step. So, rho v 2 similarly for the second MOS step and so on and so forth. So, these things actually you know uh, we are considering only a single type of uh, resource r is the total number of resources. So, it is a simplified uh, problem as such. If we have many resources many types of resources it is definitely possible to uh, you know um, extend this problem to take care of those as well. It is just a question of checking all the resource constraints uh, you know at a particular point in time. So, instead of uh, just one vector of uh, uh, resources you know uh, rather one number indicating the number of resources we would have a vector of uh, these numbers saying how many are there in each particular type. So, the length L v of a node v shows how many substrates are included in the micro operation sequence at node v and the label on edge e any particular edge e shows the execution delay of the MOS and it is denoted by d of e. So, we have uh, the resource available resource requirements of uh, a particular node v e indicated by rho v of i for each sub step i of uh, that node and we have on the label on the edges coming out of uh, the node v or incoming edges of node v the execution delay of the particular MOS. So, now the formal uh, notation and description of the problem is here. The problem is to find the shortest uh, schedule sigma and sigma is a mapping from V to N. Why? For each node V we need to find a time slot. The time slot is nothing but a natural number. So, which is the uh, time slot in which V can be executed? that is the schedule that we want to find. For each node v, we want to find a particular number of that kind and there are now restrictions. So, what are the restrictions? For all the edges e say u comma v in the set of edges e, sigma v minus sigma u must be greater than or equal to d of e. So, what does this tell us? Let us look at the picture. So, here is a node u, here is a node v, u has been scheduled at uh, the time slot sigma u. Let us say node v has been scheduled at the time slot sigma v. Obviously, sigma v comes later than sigma u because u must be executed before v. There is a precedence constraint 
uh, rather uh, edge connecting u and v which says u must be completed before v. The delay on the edge u v is d. So, this delay d must be less than or equal to the schedule of uh, v which is sigma v minus the schedule of u that is sigma u. This is quite uh, uh, easy to understand because uh, we cannot start v before we complete sigma u. So, how much time does sigma u uh, rather uh, completing u, how much time does u take? It starts at uh, the slot sigma u then it requires at least d slots more in order to complete. So, sigma u plus d is the minimum time at which we can start that is why d less than or equal to sigma v minus sigma u. So, that is the precedence constraint and uh, sigma v minus sigma u greater than or equal to the delay on the edge e. What about resources? This says if you sum up all the resource requirements at a particular point in time, all the resource requirements must be less than or equal to r. So, let us understand this better. So, let us say you know we have this matrix each row indicates an m y s corresponding to a node say v 1, v 2, v 3, v 4 etcetera etcetera. So, each one of these is a m y s and uh, since we know that one time slot is required for each one of these uh, m y s sub steps. So, here is the time slot of the m y s sub steps. Okay. So, we are going to uh, this is not a valid schedule it violates certain conditions, but this will tell you what the resource constraint is all about. Let us say the first uh, m y s v 1 has been scheduled at time 0, second m y s at uh, time 4. So, 1, 2, 3, 4 you know 4 steps are needed 4 time slots are needed for uh, sigma v 1 to complete v 1 to complete. So, sigma v 3 cannot be started before uh, the fourth uh, time slot. Then we require 5 time slots for uh, v 2. So, v 3 starts at 9 then we need 3 for v 3. So, v 4 starts at 12. We have taken care of all the uh, precedence constraints the delays and so on, but then uh, this did not check the uh, resource requirements. So, let us uh, consider the red diagonal and the blue diagonal. Okay. So, first look at the blue diagonal. So, let us say we are looking at uh, you know v 4 okay, in its uh, second uh, time step rather sub step. Okay. So, at this point the, uh, the elements in the matrix really show how many resource elements are needed for that particular sub step. So, for example, uh, sig uh, v 1 in time slot 0 requires 1 resource, in time slot 1 requires 1 resource, time slot 2 requires 2 resources etcetera etcetera. So, similarly, v 4 requires 1, 2, 3 and 2 resources in the time slot 0, 1, 2 and 3 are starting at 12. So, at this point in time that is we are looking at this is uh, time slot 12, time slot 13, 14 and 15. Time slot 12 we require uh, 2 resources because of v 4, but remember v 3 has not yet completed v 3 started at 9. So, it is actually at you know it requires uh, 9, 10, 11 right. So, you know uh, all so these are all the uh, you know time slots that are needed for this particular uh, uh, particular node to complete. So, what we really say is okay, let us see how what are the various uh, um, you know timing requirements and resource requirements of uh, these slots. So, for example, this requires 2 here, 2 here and 2 here these are all the concurrently executing uh, threads that we have. So, the sum of all these is uh, 5 right. So, when we have assuming that there are 5 uh, resources in this particular system. So, the number of resources that we are using at a particular time let us say is 5. So, we have uh, 5 uh, resources and uh, utilization is also 5. So, the resource constraints are satisfied, 
but when you look at the red uh, resources okay red uh, circles here we find that there is a violation if you add up these uh, 3 and 3 and 2 we really make it 8 right so because there are 8 uh, um, resources being used but there are only 5 at least we want to use 8 but uh, there are only 5 that means uh, the number of resources available is less than the number of resources that we are trying to use. So, there is a violation. So, that is precisely what I said this is not a valid schedule. If this were to be a valid schedule this would not have occurred. We would have actually uh, summed up these things to be less than or equal to 5. So, this is not a valid schedule because the resource requirements at a particular point in time are uh, actually uh, in, you know beyond uh, what is available in the system. So, that is what this is rho v I of uh, i minus uh, sigma v is less than or equal to r that is what it should be, but it is not. And uh, the length of the schedule in a valid schedule would be maximum of sigma v plus uh, l v where v is in v. So, we just take uh, the maximum sigma v and uh, uh, L v that is if that is not the maximum of uh, whole thing we know one of the previous steps may have a smaller sigma v, but a larger L v. So, that may contribute to the maximum of uh, the schedule. So, that is the you know uh, meaning of this right. So, we have uh, demonstrated that uh, uh, at some point in time uh, may there may be a satisfied uh, resource requirements, but at some other point in time in an invalid schedule there will be violation of uh, resource requirements. So, this should never happen resource requirements must be satisfied at every point in time. So, how do we schedule the instructions? So, that uh, the resource constraints and the precedence constraints are both satisfied they find the shortest uh, the here is a simple algorithm and this is a variation of the very well known list scheduling algorithm that is uh, that people have studied in operating systems in job shop uh, scheduling and so on. The requirement is find the shortest uh, schedule sigma which is a mapping from v to n such that precedence and resource constraints are satisfied. And whenever there are holes, we assume that they are filled with no ops. So, here is a basic outline of uh, the function called list schedule, which takes the DAG as its input v comma e. How does it work? It really does a topological sort of uh, the graph. So, it starts with those nodes in the graph which uh, do not have any predecessors those are the root nodes of uh, v. Okay. So, the DAG may not be a single component you know it may be a forest of uh, da, you know uh, DAGs right it is not necessary to have just one. So, in such a case the number of root nodes uh, of uh, that graph will be more than one. There is a queue called a ready queue which stores all the nodes which are eligible to be scheduled. Okay. So, root nodes of v are eligible to be scheduled because they have no predecessors and when we begin with the root nodes of v all the resources are assume, assumed to be available. It does not mean that every node in the ready queue can be scheduled in the same time slot. We still have not found time slots for all the nodes in the ready queue. Okay. So, we just come from the top and include nodes as we go along the schedule to begin with is phi it has nothing. So, there is a loop while ready not equal to phi do. So, in which uh, we actually take out nodes from the ready queue and then schedule it put something else into the ready queue and keep doing this until all the nodes in the graph are scheduled. So, in that case ready node cannot uh, ready list cannot get any more nodes. So, we stop when ready becomes phi. So, pick a node of highest priority from the ready queue and call that as v. So, how to do this we will see a little later. So, let us assume that there is a prioritization of uh, nodes in the ready list 
and one of the highest priority the uh, nodes the highest priority node is picked. Then we need to compute the lower bound on the time slots at which the node V can be scheduled. So, this is done by the function satisfy precedence constraints which we are going to see very soon V comma schedule comma sigma. Then uh, once we have found the minimum time slot in which V can be scheduled, this is done by looking at the precedence requirements. We need to check uh, whether that minimum time slot satisfies uh, resource constraints, whether all the resources which are needed are available to us and if so, fine. Otherwise, we need to actually keep that slot vacant, take the next slot, check whether resources are available at that point and so on and so forth. So, this is done by the routine satisfy resource constraints V comma schedule comma sigma comma L V. So, once we have found uh, sigma V which is the time slot which satisfies both the precedence and uh, resource constraints we include that node as a scheduled node. So, schedule equal to schedule plus v. Then the ready list needs to be updated. So, what do we mean by updating? We take out the node v from the ready list here remember we did not take it out. We take it out then we try to add those uh, successors of uh, the node v which actually you know are now ready to be scheduled. In other words, their own uh, you know successors uh, uh, you know for example, uh, V is the node to be scheduled uh, which has been just now scheduled. There are three successors U 1, U 2 and uh, U 3 for this particular node. Then W 1 and W 2 are two other predecessors of U 1 and U 3 they have already been scheduled. So, it u 1 was waiting for v to be scheduled. So, now v also has been scheduled. So, u 1 is now ready for scheduling. u 2 has only v as its uh, predecessor. So, u 2 is also ready for its uh, scheduling. u 3 is similarly ready because w 2 is already scheduled. So, v is now just now scheduled. So, this is also ready for scheduling. But Another successor of V which is X 2 has a predecessor X 1 which is not yet scheduled. So, even though V has been scheduled X 2 cannot be scheduled because X 1 has not yet been scheduled. It can be scheduled only after X 1 is scheduled. So, that is what we do here. We take out V and then include all those nodes U such that u is not in scheduled list. So, obviously, u should not have been scheduled already and then and for all w comma u in E, u w must be already scheduled. So, for this node all its predecessors must be scheduled w is the predecessor of u and u is now being uh, you know put into the ready list. So, all its predecessors must already be scheduled that is what we said here x 1 cannot be is not yet scheduled. So, x 2 cannot be included in the ready list, but u 1, u 2 and u 3 will be included in the ready list. Now, what are the two functions satisfy precedence constraint and satisfy resource constraint do? They consider sigma u plus d of u v over all the scheduled nodes u. Okay. So, for, so and then return the maximum of uh, this value. So, let us see what it really means. So, we are uh, looking at uh, V okay. and now we are looking at all the predecessors of uh, V. So, that is what this said see sigma V is our node we are looking at uh, U comma V where U is a predecessor. So, all the predecessors which have been scheduled you know that they are already we know that they are scheduled because otherwise we would not have uh, included v in the ready list okay so these are all the scheduled predecessors already 
Now, there they have been scheduled at uh, 10, 25 and uh, 18. Right? So, what is the time slot at which we can be lower bound at which uh, we can be scheduled. So, just look at this, this is 10, the delay is 2, so 10 plus 2 is uh, 12, this is 25 plus 4 is 29 and 18 plus 3 is 21. So, 29 is the large value, so before the time slot 29, we cannot really schedule V, why? If we do that, then U 2 would not have completed by that time. So, we take 28 for example, U 2 completes at 29. So, the values computed by U 2 will not be available to V, therefore, 28 is an illegal slot. So, that is what this really is all about. So, the max in this case was this okay, 29, the others were did not contribute to the maximum. So, this gives you the lower bound at which uh, the node V can be scheduled. But the precedence constraint on its own will not tell us whether resources available are available for executing V at that lower bound value will say of 29. The function satisfy resource constraint checks this availability. So, for example, we start at L B and uh, every time slot L B plus 1, L B plus 2, L B plus 3 etcetera from that point onwards is checked. This says infinity, but uh, you really do not go to infinity because there are only a finite number of uh, instructions number 1. Each instruction has a finite number of MOS steps and we know that every instruction terminates. So, eventually after a certain number of steps, every instruction preceding V would have completed execution. So, resources must become available. So, this will never be really uh, an infinite loop. It is just shown that, that we do not know how many instructions we need, how many slime slots we need to check, that is why this says L b to infinity. So, from L b onwards, we check L b, L b plus 1, L b plus 2, L b plus 3, etcetera, etcetera. And what we check are exactly the same as what we I showed you beforehand. The sum of the resources, resource requirements of various time steps must be less than or equal to r. So, this is the sum of the resource requirements of the other instructions which are concurrently executing with uh, v. Rho v j is the uh, resource requirement of the jth substep of uh, node v. So, these two together tell you about the total resource requirements of uh, the entire sequence. So, this must be true for all values of j from 0 to L v that is for all substeps of the node v. So, once we find a time slot i at which uh, the resource requirements are also satisfied and that is that may be L b, L b plus 1, L b plus 2 etcetera, etcetera. We return that value i as the slot at which we can be scheduled. So, for example, take the previous uh, schedule itself. So, here we this is uh, sigma v 1, this is v 1, this is v 2 etcetera, etcetera, this is v 3 and this is v 4. Why did we show these two in red? So, this is time slot 0, this is time slot 4, this is time slot 9, 10, 11, 14 etcetera, etcetera. So, what uh, this particular uh, these two time slots have been uh, left free nothing has been scheduled simply because uh, uh, scheduling uh, this instruction uh, you know V 3 in any one of these violates the resource constraint. So, if we leave this to free then you know the resource constraints will not be violated this is just for the sake of example you know it may be one slot it may be two slots or three slots in uh, practice. But, uh, here I have just shown these two as vacant saying that it is possible that two slots would be left free and then the uh, you know resource constraints would be satisfied if we schedule v 3 at 11 and v 4 at 14. So, that is why we have left these two slots free. So, uh, the L b would have been 9 okay, because of precedence constraints. So, this is 0 then plus 4 then plus 5 9. 
but uh, LB plus LB and LB plus one are not suitable for scheduling V3 because resources are not available. Let us say resources are available at uh, 11 that is 11, 12, 13 these three time steps resources become available. So, therefore, we can schedule them at that time slot and uh, you know then resource uh, uh, constraints will be satisfied no violations occur. Now, how do we uh, actually order these nodes? So, in the priority ordering here, you know, I said pick the highest priority node in the ready list, right. We did not say what is the priority ordering that we use, that is what we want to see now. We let us consider uh, two or three of these varieties. One of them is the height of a node in the directed acyclic graph, that is longest path from the node to a terminal node. So, if uh, the longer the path, the higher the priority, why? You know, if the path is longer, that means uh, there are many instructions which depend on this particular node. So, it is better if that node is uh, scheduled early, that is the heuristic that uh, one uses. So, let me show you an example. So, here is a simple uh, directed acyclic graph. The legend says uh, inside is node number, left side is path length and right side is execution time, below is latency. So, if you look at the nodes here, these are the leaf nodes. For the leaf nodes, we say that uh, execution time of the node is the uh, you know path length. So, execution time is 1 here, so path length is also 1, execution time is 2 here, so path length is 2. When we go to this particular node, so we take the execution time here, path length here, add the delay, so that becomes uh, 3. We take the path length here, add the delay that is 0, so it becomes 2. So, the maximum of these really becomes the uh, path length for this particular node 4, that is what this says latency n comma m plus path length of m. So, max over all the successors of the node n, so that we did. So, then for this it is 3 plus 0, so that is 3 and 3 plus 2 that is 5 here path length and this becomes 3 plus 1 that is 4. So, this is how path lengths are uh, computed At let us say when we start uh, scheduling, let us say we consider these two nodes then 4 and 5. So, this has a longer uh, path length, larger path length. So, this node would be scheduled first and not this particular node. Then, so the, you know uh, okay, maybe we can even look at the scheduling of uh, this particular uh, DAG bef before we go to the other heuristic. So, the algorithm says consider the uh, root nodes of the DAG, so that is 1 and 3, these are the only two which will be put into the ready list. So, 1 and 3 are in the ready list, we need to pick the highest priority node from that ready list that is path length. So, 5 and 4, so node 3 which has the path length 5 is picked because it is higher. So, that is why the schedule indicates node 3 as uh, the first node. Let us assume that there are uh, enough number of resources to execute any number of instructions in uh, parallel. So, we do not have to worry about resource constraints in this simple example. The next example we will look at that also. Then 3 is completed, but then uh, the successor instruction is 4 that cannot be executed until 2 is completed and 2 cannot be completed unless 1 is completed. So, 1 is in the so 1 is the only instruction in the ready queue right now. So, we are going to include 1 in uh, you know in the schedule, schedule it in the next time step after 3. There is since the you know uh, the number of resources available is very large, no limitation. So, there is no problem about uh, using resources. So, 1 can be scheduled in the next time slot because 1 does not depend on so, the next one after 1, the node number 2 can now be included in the ready list. 
So, because 2 has only 1 as its predecessor, 2 can be now included in the ready list. The minimum time slot at which uh, 2 can be uh, scheduled is uh, you know uh, this was scheduled let us say time slot 0 uh, plus 1. So, that is the time slot at which uh, 2 can be scheduled. Okay. So, if uh, so we can compute the time slots at which these instructions can be scheduled in this manner. So, now uh, whereas, if we assume that only one instruction can be issued in every cycle that is uh, you cannot have more than one instruction each cycle. Then you know we have scheduled 3 at time slot 0, 1 at time slot 1. right? So, the minimum available time slot for uh, this node number 2 is sigma of 1 plus 1. So, that is uh, time slot number 2. So, after at the time slot 2 we schedule this node 2 because it has no other predecessors and once 2 is complete you know after time slot number of time slot 0 uh, and that 4 can be scheduled. The reason is node number 3 which was initiated in time slot 0 will complete in 2 time slots. So, by the time we uh, reach time slot 2 3 would have completed. So, 4 can be scheduled in time slot uh, 3. So, because uh, both its operands are ready and once 4 is completed we again have uh, 5 and 6 put into the ready queue. Now, which of these should be picked again we use the path length as the criterion 2 and 1. So, node 6 has path length 2 which is higher than path length 1 of node 5. So, schedule node 6 first and followed by node 5. Now, the ready list is uh, empty and we have assigned a time slot for each one of the nodes in the directed acyclic graph. So, that completes the this particular uh, scheduling process for the uh, example. Now, what is the second heuristic that can be used? We can compute what are known as uh, earliest start time and uh, latest start time E start and L start for each of the nodes. So, what exactly is E start? It tells you that you cannot schedule a particular node earlier than the value of E start. And uh, if you say what is L start, L start tells you that this is the latest time by which you should schedule the node. And if you violate uh, either the E start value or the L start value and schedule it outside these limits, this may result in pipeline stalls. Okay. So, as far as possible we should try to stick to the time slots between E start and L start and schedule the nodes, but uh, E start and L start are really based on uh, precedence constraints they do not consider any resource constraints. Therefore, we may still have to violate the E start and L start value sometimes because of resource constraints, but then since there are not many resources available there will be pipeline stalls and that cannot be helped. How do you compute E start V? E start V is computed as the maximum over all the uh, nodes 1 to k you know. So, you are really looking at uh, the predecessors of uh, the node V u i comma V. So, u i are all the predecessors there are k of them. So, you consider the E start value of u i and the delay of the edge u i comma v take the max over it that gives you e start of v. So, let us see how this is done. So, you have v node v here which is to be for which you need to want you want to compute e start these are the three predecessors. So, u 1, u 2, u 3. So, they have their uh, you know uh, e start values already computed. Okay. So, that is 25, 45 and 16 let us say the delays are uh, d 1, d 2, d 3, 4, 7 and 2 respectively. So, you look at 25 plus 4 the at 45 plus 7 and 16 plus 2. So, that means 29, 52, 18 the max is obviously 52. So, this is how you compute the E start value. So, this tells you that we cannot start before time slot 52. Okay. So, that is that makes sense because we are really looking at the human time at which uh, 
all the three predecessors of the node we complete that is 45 plus 7. Okay. Now, the E start value of the source node is taken as uh, 0, we begin the computation of uh, the E start value from the top assuming the source node has a 0 E start value. What about L start? It is from the bottom. So, L start u is computed as the minimum over all the successors. So, you want to compute the L start value of u, there are successors for u, those are all the V i nodes 1 to k. Take the L start of uh, the successor node, subtract the latency and take the minimum of this particular computation over all the successors. So, let us see what we mean. There are three successors, again we want to compute the L start value for v w 1, w 2, w 3, their L start values are 12, 36 and uh, 21. So, now what is the L start value for node v? 12 minus 2, 36 minus 1 and 21 minus 3. So, the minimum of all this is 10. So, that is the latest uh, time at which uh, node v can be scheduled. So, if you schedule later than that, then you know we are going to create some uh, pipeline stalls. That is very obvious, you see. So, if this is uh, let us say 10. So, 10 plus 2 is 12 here and 10 plus 1 is 36 and 10 plus 3 is uh, 13, right. So, if you uh, this can be scheduled at uh, time slot 2, that is why 10 plus 2 is 12. So, if you actually exceed uh, L, then uh, this node uh, will not be scheduled at 12, it will be scheduled at uh, some other value. So, there would be some kind of a stall, but that cannot be helped if there are not many resources available. So, now, once we compute the E start value starting from the top, the L start value of the sync node is set as its uh, E start value and we start computing the L start values from the bottom towards the top. So, E start and L start can be computed using a top down and bottom up uh, pass respectively either statically before scheduling begins or dynamically during the scheduling itself. Okay. So, you know if you actually want to schedule the, the precedences uh, rather the E start and L start values during uh, the scheduling process because the graph is going to change uh, as and when we schedule certain nodes it can be done, but that requires a little extra computation at schedule time. So, a node with a lower E start or L start value has a higher priority that is one possible uh, uh, you know heuristic, but a slightly better heuristic would be consider slack which is L start minus E start. You are really looking at uh, the an interval uh, e start L start minus E start during which you want to compute uh, we want to schedule a node. So, it makes sense to consider nodes with a lower slack uh, and give them higher priority that is because uh, uh, you know E start and L start are very close. So, you there is not much gap between them. So, those nodes get uh, higher priority and those which have higher slack value they can be star you know uh, they can be they have many more slots in which they can be scheduled. So, they get a slightly lower priority. Instructions on the critical path may have a slack value of 0, their L start and L start values actually may coincide and hence they get the maximum priority. So, this is an example which we saw already. So, here is uh, another example. So, let me show you how the E start values and L start values are uh, really computed. So, for example, if you look at this particular graph, the add, sub and store values are supposed to have uh, 1 cycle, 2 cycles and 3 cycles respectively. In either uh, add, sub, store has 1 cycle latency, load has 2 cycles latency and mult has 3 cycle latency. The path length and slack are shown on the left side and right side of uh, the parentheses. Okay. So, 8 is the path length and 0 is the slack, okay. whereas uh, within the parentheses we are showing L, E start and L start. So, we start with uh, a value of 0 for uh, E start and then uh, you know we compute uh, 0 plus 2 as the E start value for add, 0 plus 2 for the E start value of sub and from here 2 plus uh, you know this add 1 3 
is one possibility for this particular uh, add node. Whereas, on this side 2 plus 1 is 3 is uh, the only possibility for the node mult. And then we have uh, you know for this particular node we have uh, 3 delay slot the slots for multiply. So, 3 plus 3 is 6 is the E start value for uh, add. So, this side we get 3 and this side we get 6. So, E start really is the max of these. So, it is computed as uh, 6 and then plus 1 is a 7 for this particular uh, node ST. So, this is how E start values are uh, computed. So, we will uh, stop at this point, continue this example in the next lecture when where we are going to discuss in more detail how the L start values are also computed and used for scheduling. Thank you.